Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete. Welcome back to the shop. And this is part three of a four part video on building the little mayonnaise jar steam engine. And I hope you watched the first two parts already, but when I look back, I didn't really accomplish much. It's just uh, three or four little parts here, although some of them are rather complicated. But what I want to do today is to take apart the original one. This is the prototype. And we're going to begin making the column here, which is probably the single most difficult part. And I will be using magnesium for that. Do not confuse that with manganese. They are not the same. So let's take this apart real quickly. It's just a couple of screws and it's disassembled. Okay, using the world's smallest hex key, Allen wrench, I'm going to take off the little brass keeper here. And we haven't made that yet, but it's so simple. Could be brass, steel, aluminum, and there's a very lightweight spring right here. And that will allow us now to take the cylinder along with the piston. So that's, that's the cylinder, not much to it. That's the piston and connecting rod, all one piece. You could make it with three pieces if you wanted. And let's take the flywheel off now. Kind of a tight fit. And there's the crank. Quite a bit different, quite a bit uh, shorter than this. This probably needs to be trimmed off. No probably about it, this needs to be trimmed. And then I will take the little screw out of here. If I can find a screwdriver. Okay, this is what we're going to tackle, and it will be made of 3 8 magnesium. You can certainly use steel or aluminum or whatever your little heart desires. I guess this is the first clip that I have shown you with it completely disassembled. This is the original engine that I bought at the auction. All right, here's the original column, and that's exactly two and one eighth long. So I will proceed to lay out the magnesium here. If I can get my fat fingers out of the way. Okay, there's the mark. I'll go saw it off and sand it flat, square, like I did on that end. No need to face it, although one certainly could. Be right back. All right, it's cut off to length, and I want to drill and tap the hole in the end. I'll do that on the little Atlas lathe, and that is a 632 screw that, of course, goes through the base. I'm at the Atlas Craftsman lathe, and I very much wanted to use a square collet, but then I realized these little 3C collets do not go any bigger than 5 16ths in the square, and I need 3 8 so I'm using the four-jaw chuck. So I've got the square stock pretty well centered in the four jaw chuck and I use the dial indicator method which isn't all that good because there's a, a big danger here of ruining your indicator by forgetting and turning this. But I got it pretty much right on and I'm ready to drill and tap. By the way, you can very much face the end of your work while it's in the lathe if you want, but I already squared it off nicely on the abrasive sander, so I'm ready to center drill. It's important to remember that for this hole, we only want to drill it and tap it 3 8 of an inch deep because we do not want that hole to interfere with the cross hole here for the main shaft. So I've marked the tap drill size drill here for uh, what is a 632 and I will drill up to my line. And I will proceed to tap it 632 to the bottom of the hole. 
I'll probably even run a bottoming tap in there when I go over to the bench. This is just a plug tap. Boy, that machines nicely. Magnesium. It's really the first time I've ever worked with magnesium that I can remember anyway. Okay, let's drill and ream these three sixteenths holes. One here and one here. And the bottom one, this is the bottom, is five eighths from the bottom. And the top hole is one and fifteen sixteenths from the bottom. Now I'm going to use a height gauge to lay that out. Also note here that this hole for the top shaft here is a blind hole. But in fact, I'm going to drill and ream all the way through so I do not have to deal with a blind hole. Because remember, a reamer doesn't ream to size all the way to its end. So to me, that makes it easier. Also note that this man, I don't know if that'll show up or not, that this hole is not on the center line. Okay, the bottom hole, 5 eighths. I like to use two or more height gauges, and the top one, again, one and five sixteenths. I'll use the trusty old brown and sharp for that. And the reason I'm telling you that is I went to use my other height gauge here. And, you know, I really do not like electronic instruments so much because I went to use it, and of course, the battery is dead. Well, how old is the battery? I like to date them. Well, last March 23rd, what that makes it uh, what, about seven months old, and I used this only about two or three times during that period, so no good. And I need a center line, so the height gauge is set for 3 sixteenths of an inch, which is 0.187. Hey, try to learn some of the common decimal equivalents, and I need a little bit of a center line over on the adjacent side. That should do. Next, I'm going to drill and ream these two holes, and they'll be 3 sixteenths of an inch. So there's a center drill, starter drill, one size under 3 sixteenths, and a 3 sixteenths. Now, I'm going to do that on the milling machine, but you certainly do not need to. But it's just more accurate, and you don't want to let those holes drift on you. And so I'm going to relocate them on the milling machine with an edge finder. And you're going to say, then, well, you dummy, why did you bother to lay it out? Because many of you will need that if you do it on the drill press. So let's step over real quickly. And I do not think I'm going to show you all of the steps in edge finding and locating the centers of those because I have done it countless times as well as many other creators have done. I used an edge finder to locate that bottom hole, but since the layout lines are already on there, you can certainly use your wiggler, and it's going to be pretty darn accuracy depending on your degree of skill, I suppose, so let's center drill there. And 11 sixty-fourths. And ream three sixteenths. And now I'll move up to the next hole, which is one and five sixteenths from the very bottom here. So I'm looking at my digital readout to read 1.937. Right there, and I'll center drill. And it matches up with my layout line, by the way. It's a good way to double check. And I need to drill and ream, and I, I'll do that off camera since you saw me do the same thing right here. Okay, both holes are drilled and reamed. Let's go back to the bench and do a little bit more layout, and I will remove the burrs on both sides off camera. And here's a good way to remove burrs, is take your little countersink, like that, do both sides, and then strike it with a file, and your burrs are gone. Now, if you do not have one of these, make one. This, I, I made this back when you were still in diapers, 
and it's just a countersunk sink installed into a file handle or whatever. And, and of course it rolled off the bench 10 million times. So that's the purpose of the tack, but you can buy these commercially. And I've had that for a long time. And here's one I made when I still worked at the high school. This was an aluminum handle that we used to cast up and these were used, I had lots of these because these were used on dent pullers that we made scores of over the years. I'm not sure why he made two separate little slots there because I'm gonna make it all one slot right here. And I guess the purpose of that is, can you see the way that the crank disc can be set back a little bit to give you a little more of a, a room in, in that direction. You may, un, or may, you may or may not understand that, but I'm gonna use a three quarter inch cutter. This is set at three quarters, so you can see the extremities of it is three quarters and will be on center with the hole and I will locate that. You can figure that out, it's simple enough. We do not want to drill these two holes at this time or this hole. And oh, I forgot to tell you how deep that is because I don't know how deep it is. It is, get the old Mitsutoyo out. About 35 thousandths deep or so. Off camera, I have located the center of the cutter or the spindle with the center of this hole and locked the table in the X direction and I'm ready to mill 30 thousandths deep. Did you notice the extremely fine dust in the air from magnesium? I'm wondering if that is a hazard. Should I be wearing a mask? I'm 80 years old, who cares? Okay, I'm progressing quite nicely. I mounted the column onto the base. D bird and the main shaft fits in there nicely. Now you may have to do some fitting as you go along. For instance, with my reamers, I used a power reamer over in the mill, but this little hand reamer here took off a few thousands and gave me a better fit. Same thing with the top hole here. And of course, now you can see the, the purpose for the recess, perhaps. And I need to cut the main shaft off at that black line because it's way, way too long, as you can see. Now, the top shaft here that it oscillates on or pivots on is also 3 16 steel and it's one and one fourth long. And at some point I will Loctite that in. Remember, I ran the hole all the way through instead of making it a blind hole and I will Loctite it in so it is flush with the outside. So that's what it looks like so far. I've made a lot of progress, I believe. I'm progressing nicely. I'm ready to start the cylinder. This is the original cylinder. And it's inch and three sixteenths long. Again, it's three eighths. By the way, from examining this, I can see that the person that made this used 3 8 square key stock because it is plated. So consider key stock to be your source of, and you probably got some in the drawer. Anyway, I already cut a piece off, one and three sixteenths long, and I squared the ends off. And the first thing I'm going to do, and there's not a whole lot to this, but it still can be just a little bit tricky. So I'm going to drill and ream a 1 4th inch hole in the atlas lathe, four jaw chuck again, and how deep is it? There's a reamer. Well, I better measure here. I know this looks crude. I'll do a better job. And it's about five eighths deep. And remember that the stroke is only three eighths. So this should work fine. Let's go over to the Atlas lathe. And the four jaw chuck is already in the correct position because I only backed out 
two jaws. That's a little trick for you, too. By the way, start buying yourself tools and machinery. Forget about those Nike tennis shoes. They do not matter. One other thing I need to show you before we go over to the lathe, and again, the depth, 5 eighths checked with this little stir at depth gauge. But the reason for that depth is we do not want the hole to come all the way up to that 3 16 hole, but we do want it to come up and go a little bit up past, past this 1 16 inch hole because that is the air inlet or seam inlet to the cylinder. So it could even be a little bit deeper let's say all almost up to that hole. Okay, let's center drill. Fifteen sixty-four drill, five eighths deep. And ream one fourth until I strike the bottom. Okay, the cylinder looks great. A few more operations that I will do in part four. There's actually two holes and a little bit to mill off and the cylinder will be done. One last thing I want to do today, and that is to Loctite this pivot rod in place. I'm using that red Loctite. I want to get it flush. And that will set overnight and be ready to use. And you know what? That's just enough excitement. That's all I can take with my bad heart. Well, if you like what I'm doing, please give me a thumbs up and tell your friends about this. And in the following part, which is part four, we will do a few other things that need to be done and assemble a thing and test run it and that's where the real excitement is and you know I don't know why I said I have a bad heart my heart is strong as an ox the doctor tells me so that's it for today for part three be sure and tune in for part four when it is available this is Mr. Pete saying so long for now and enjoy your shop during these long winter months. Forget about that television.